Hey, Star Baby, how you doing? It's fine. Excellent. Um, we're a little bit late because you were doing your hair. I wanted to trim your moustache. And... and it looks awesome and my eyebrows are freshly trimmed. Uh, my, my microphone's broken, so I, I, hopefully there are no audio issues. As long as you can hear me, it doesn't matter if I don't sound that great because as you were just saying, I'm not going to be doing much talking anyway. But the bit that I normally do the talking is right at the beginning. Um, I got this list of questions. We ended the last episode, which was part one of your F4G experience, which is kind of weird because you've talked about the F4G in, in several other episodes that we've already recorded. And of course, we did the Strike Eagle episodes with you too. If somebody is listening to this and they're new and then check them out, go and do that. So it's kind of weird to be talking about F4G sort of this late in the day, chronologically speaking, but we are. I don't see how we're going to wrap it up today because we have got the list of, of stories that we ended with on the last episode, which was part one of F4G. Um, in addition to that, I think you've got some Maverick video and I've got this APR 47 simulator, which you sent me, which is running in DOS. And I've got about 90 minutes or so of time. So I, I, I mean, is this going to go to three parts? Yes. There we go. All right. How how do you want how do you want today to to pan out then? So we because we we sort of talked through then your time flying it. We talked a little bit uh, seriously about your ability to influence the work that you worked on take nine thousand. I think you said for the F four G, which I think was the last OFP tape. Um, is is there anything else to talk about career wise then from, uh, about your time on the F four G before we get to the series of humorous anecdotes and the simulator and the maverick shots yeah we're gonna actually do a literary um device called a flashback <laughs> and <laughs> we're going to talk about the f4g's electronic suite again so that i can package it up because there were some questions that emerged this week about the difference between the apr 38 and the apr 47 and earlier stuff, we talked about the APR-38. You did that in an episode really before I ever showed up. So I'm going to walk it back. We're going to show the DOS computer simulator, which will show the displays. And I've got it up and running too. So whoever gets the better display wins. Um, And then we will show some Maverick tape, at least some of it. And we can go into questions and humorous anecdotes, including the you know, very long and ungodly complex story of what happens when you put Star Baby in charge of the air show program. <laughs> Does that tie into the uh, the strippers in the limo story? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Because we never got to the end of that. You and I were talking about that offline um, months and months ago, and, and we never got to the end of the story. So I never, because I said to you, don't tell me it now. I, I want to hear it fresh. And we never, so we've never got back to doing that. Okay. Before we do that, though, British food, what's what's your problem? Um, well, the idea that a, an entire cuisine would be based on boiling something until it loses all of its color and then serving it, I, I, I mean, literally, it's not like I haven't been to a bunch of countries and sampled a bunch of cuisines and somebody has to be at the bottom. And really, you know, it's particularly the English. You're proud about being on the bottom. I don't understand it. I mean, because the constant answer is, well, we can always go get a curry. Yeah. That's not British food. That's from when the British Empire conquered somebody with good food. And I note mean, how many people moved to India because even though it was hot, the food was better. That was the main driver. But there is there is a curry dish. So, okay, so here's a, here's a challenge for the audience. Um, so, so Star Baby, as you would know, if you listen to the Strike Eagle episodes, lived in the UK for three years. And so he was out near Newmarket, which is not really known. It's known for its horses. It's not really known for its culinary delights. Um, but as I saw on a video today, apparently some of the, I, I don't know if it's 10 of the the top 10 restaurants in the world are in London, but they're all serving someone else's cuisine. So here's a challenge to the audience. If you're British, post a comment and tell us which foods you like the most and why Star Baby is wrong, even though clearly he's right. Um, I'll start. <laughs> I'll start with, with a sticky toffee pudding. Did you have sticky toffee pudding when you were here? I've never even heard of sticky toffee there we pudding. Go. You see, you haven't you don't have the sample size big enough to be able to say those things about British cuisine. You've never okay. heard of sticky toffee pudding. Well, you know, for people that don't speak the king's English, pudding means dessert. 
Okay. And so, you know, but I had trouble adjusting to that. Pudding, generally, if it's not like jello pudding, for example, you know, something like rice pudding, which is completely, utterly, and totally disgusting. Um, it just means something that you have added milk into and turned into a mush and you expect people to eat it by calling it something innocuous like pudding. Or, or spotted dick, uh, less innocuous. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> and that's definitely a real thing. It's not it necessarily is. a disease that it's... can be cured by penicillin, which is unfortunate. Okay, this is one I'm never going to win, so let's move away. But there we, there we go. That's the challenge to the audience. Post your favorite British cuisine dish. All right, where are we going now? You tell me. Okay, so let's talk about the F4G and the APR47 and, and wrap things up uh, so we can talk more about the APR47. So the F4G, while it came out of Vietnam experience, the real impetus for making the advanced wild weasel, because the F4G is wild weasel five, the advanced wild weasel, came out of the Yom Kippur War. Because 1973, Israelis over the Sinai Peninsula, Peninsula, they were pretty much torn to bits in the early days by Soviet-provided equipment, specifically the SA-6, on which we call the Gainful, and which the Russians call the Kub, and the ZSU-23-4, which we call the ZSU-23-4, that's an anti-aircraft tank, and the Russians call the Shilka. And so... Those radar-guided systems did a lot of damage. Our jamming was ineffective. Our radar warning gear didn't see some of the signals. And so that is really what got the F4G its impetus. And the funding, some of the start funding for the project came out of the PAVE spike program, which gave us daytime target designation pods to follow on the PAVE knife. PAVE spike was much smaller, easier to carry. And... Two F4D models were converted for test purposes and what would eventually become the APR-38. Now, the D model was not an optimum choice. It was just the aircraft that happened to be available for the test. And the E model was chosen for the conversion uh, to get the APR-38 because the E model had really more room. And part of that was because it had the, the modifications made for the gun. So you think of the gun as don't say we just finally you get a gun in the Phantom. Well, the G model takes it out. And the reason it takes the gun out is because we needed all that volume, not only for the gun in the chin, but the ammunition bay that held all the ammunition and the feed systems. Because the APR 38 is 25 black boxes made by six different manufacturers and strung together by a whole bunch of cable along with 52 antennas. And so you can see on the picture behind Steve right now, you can see the nose extension, which is where you know, the gun went with some additional stuff added in. But 30 of those antennas are right up there in the front. They're behind the little black ray dome, not the big one with the pitot tube sticking out of it, but the small one. And the little domino looking thing, which you can barely see the left and right. Each of those is a 10 element in inter I'm not going to get this right interfer yeah nope can't get my tongue around it um, it uses it uses phase comparison uh in order to determine the direction of arrival of the signal so 40 of our antennas covered the the mid and high bands and the 30 are up in the chin and that tail the football on the tail has another 10 antennas pointing aft behind that little black radome and then you can see other blades and so on pointing around. You can also see a couple of black dashes uh, underneath the front cockpit windscreen. Those are low band antennas. And then a couple of the blades are omnidirectional antennas, one of which is used for listening to uh, the audio, one of which is actually our lower radio antenna, and one of which is our tachyon antenna. But suffice it to say, there's 52 of these guys around. And 116 F4Es, all from... Block 41, which was the 1969 production year. So all weasels have, all F4Gs have 69 tail numbers, which is most excellent, naturally. And so they were all built, actually, when I was three. And they were converted, really, starting in 1975 to 8, moving on. 116 of them. 
a number of those aircraft were actually the Peace Jack airframes. And Peace Jack was when we loaned F-4s to Australia to use while they were waiting for their F-111 delivery. So one of the jets that had my name on it, which was 697212, which was the top killer in the Gulf War, was actually a Peace Jack airframe. And so uh, when I had some artwork done of it, it has a little Australian flag in the artwork on the spitter plate. Uh, so people that didn't know the Aussies operated Phantoms, the Aussies operated Phantoms. Uh, we loaned them, they gave them back, and a bunch of those were converted to weasels. Um, at least two of the aircraft that were converted were MiG killers. So they had bagged MiGs um, in Vietnam. And the only one I remember was 277, which was one of the first jets that we got at Nellis. Um, it was unfortunately, we could not save it from the drone program and is somewhere in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, the guys would not, uh, they would not turn off the shoot down of a MiG killer. It was hugely annoying and very depressing. Oh. Uh, no respect. Especially and, given that the, all those F-16s were going to come, come along later, we used as drones. Um, yes, actually the perfect drone, right? Because it's already fly-by-wire. Um, and so... The back cockpit of the F-4G was then missionized. And so the back, the cockpit of the F-4 is not your greatest visibility cockpit ever. But uh, all that was taken away. And your radar stayed where it was. And your flight control instruments moved up to the top, which actually wasn't bad. Um, it just meant that you, your radar instrument cross-check was going to be very hard to do. But if you were actually doing instrument flying, um, having them up high, I found to be very comfortable they didn't spend a lot of time looking down. It allowed me to be instrument cross-check and outside fairly easily. But, you know, if I'm on instruments, we're in the clouds anyway, so I'm not seeing Jack. And then in front of the EWO was all the APR-47. And most of the controls, except for a keypad on the lower right that went in front of the radar control uh, handle. And we're going to pull up a display that shows you what that looks like. So are you capable of displaying your, your DOS image? I, I can do it, yeah. Manipulate it? It's, it's going to be, it might be a little bit, bit smaller on my screen, but we can try it, and then I'll just use the uh, editing software to try and make it look bigger, but uh, here we go. You can also um, change oh, your... Actually, I can, I can share the app. Let's try that. Um, so I can oh, see. yeah. You've got it, full screen. Is it full screen? Oh, sweet. Okay, so I'm going to describe it, and I'm going to tell you what to manipulate. Um, because there's not a whole lot of manipulation. All right, so this is an unclassified display that was put on the PC uh, by our, our support team at Warner Robins, the guys that programmed it. I'm not sure what it was for, but at least it shows you the symbology, some of which is actually fake. So the first thing I'm going to have you do is, in the lower left was the switch, which was our step switch. Press it down the step, and go up to go back to the beginning of the queue. So right now, you have the highest priority threat is this airborne interceptor, this wing form that's up at the 12 o'clock position. And in reality, there would have been a display code, a two-letter display that told you what that wing form was. So an F-15 would get a 15, obviously. Uh, a MiG-29 would get a 29, obviously. Um, and we have stuff like that. So hit the S on your keyboard, Sierra. My keyboard's gone to sleep, but it's waking up. There you go. Okay, so now you've stepped to the next high, highest priority threat, and in this case, it's the SA-11. And so the diamond is where the EWO is thinking. That drives a bunch of things. So the display is to that particular target. So you're on 10-mile display, you're 10-mile range, and I can't see, let's see. So hit the R yeah. key. All right, we're going to go to tw we're now on a 25 mile scope and you can see in the upper right here the range display goes from 10 to 200. 25 and 50 were the most common. If you had to go down to 10, it was a pretty emitter dense environment. So we'll leave it on 25. So each of those range rings is 5 nautical miles from the weasel in the center. The 11 has a little circle under it, meaning it is range quality 2. So a symbol like the 8 which has no circle is range quality 3 that's considered to be range unknown. Range quality two is range known. And then if you look at the six at the three o'clock position, you'll notice that that little circle is in the middle. That's range quality one. 
Now, we're still not going to talk about what the range qualities meant in terms other than range known or range unknown, but range quality one was surprisingly good. Um, and the other, the other thing that the diamond is driving is, is you look at the top and you see that that emitter is bearing 316 degrees at 14.1 nautical miles. Um, and so that is pretty spiffy information. Now, you'll, what you'll see happening in the bottom, because it's moving, is the Whiskey 1016 is cycling through. So whiskey means worldwide. So this is, we had a number of theater libraries in the system. You could select worldwide, you could select Europe, you could select Middle East, etc. And each of these had a number of scan tables, which were set up to scan for certain types of threats. Scan table zero was the mandatory one. And each of these had to be normally done in a certain specified period of time, which is in the low single-digit seconds, mostly. And so it scans through zero, which is your mandatory scan table. One is your optional threat scan table. Um, and I have no idea what six was. Two was uh, your long-dwell emitters, like early warning radars. Four was low probability of intercept emitters. I mean, there were all these neat little uh, systems in there. And this is something, when I see I reprogram the system, I can change the contents of any theater and any scan table just by reprogramming it from the console, which I did on every sortie. Um, and so right now, worldwide, and it's scanning 016, and it's scanning pretty fast. Uh, and that, for a, a low pulse density environment, this might be pretty nicely timed. So hit the space bar. This moves you over to the right side of the screen. And remember, you have an SA-11 handed, uh, uh, a mark. So it's going to give me the frequency and the PRF. So you see megahertz and PPS under frequency PRF. Now, obviously, the SA-11 is not at 22, 22 megahertz with 23,000 pulses per second um, because you don't want to classify the display. Uh, but nevertheless, it gave me the frequency and PRF. The scan and range data gave uh, a whole bunch of other uh, information that would be changing in real time. Um, most of which I don't remember and the rest of which I'm not going to explain uh, because it tells you too much about how the system works. The attack scope, which is up, which is the crosshairs, the emitter is actually off to the left and low. Um, so that's a little circle tells you where the emitter was. If you were doing a ground attack, uh, we didn't have a heads-up display. We had a combining glass with that little red bullseye that goes up there. But there was also a green cross. And the green cross was the emitter, where the emitter was. So if the pilot had the green cross inside the combining glass, it would be inside those brackets on the attack scope. And when he centered it up, that little dot goes under the crosshairs. So you know from the back... Uh, where the uh, pilot has, uh, whether or not they had the emitter centered up. But we didn't use the attack scope for much more than low altitude use of non-harm ordnance when you had to run in on a guy. On the lower left, which is actually smaller than it is in the real world to fit on the screen, this is the pan scope. And this covers all the frequency um, displays that might be on there. So this is frequency and amplitude, so low frequency in the bottom left all the way up to the higher frequency in the top right. So this is, it's a, a long line that has been chopped up and stacked. Oh. And if an emitter is under the diamond, it shows up there with a vertical bar. The taller the bar is, the more signal strength you have. If that bar is displayed on the round scope to the left, it's got that little tick mark above it. If I were, like, say, on a bar lock, which has five or six beams, depending on the model, and I had the diamond over the bar lock, and it were seeing all six of the beams, it would put diamonds under all six of the beams. So when you look at an EWO doing signal identification, you really had some great tools. And you could look at the frequency, you could look at the PRI, you could listen to the signals, you could count beams, 
If you wanted to, you could go to the oscilloscope function of the attack scope, which this will not display because it's an oscilloscope and it's boring, uh, and actually time the scan rate uh, to help you determine what it might be. So you have some great identification tools. Now, if you look at the upper left, you've got the cranium light under AGM status, and you're going to hit the T key on your keyboard. This is a target handoff simulation, and that changes to a ready light. And for seven seconds, that means you've just handed off your planned handoff word, which is primary, secondary, and tertiary lists, with the primary being the guy under the diamond. And there were, as I've gone over before, if somebody wants to go back to the cockpit tour episode, I'll talk about a lot more of what the buttons actually do uh, on the assumption that I could remember it. Okay, hit the space bar again and go back. So, again, um, we could step through the targets, and I've pretty much displayed the symbology, or explained it. An E would be an echo band unknown. A W is an early warning. And that little asterisk is just something that the scope could display. It actually never gets a, a little circle under it, really. Um, but those were waypoints. So this was huge and that this was our only equivalent to a tactical situation display in that you could program for tape 8000, you could program one waypoint and for tape 9000, you could program five. So you could box out an area, you, like I said, usually bullseye and there were some special functions. So right now, if I call out SA11 316 for 14. That's relative to me. And if you don't know where I am, that is not useful information. But I could use Specialist Zero on the Arnie 101 and look down to my lower right. Uh, and it would give me the bearing and range to bullseye. So I can call that out with not having to do any brain work. I just look down at the display. So when you're talking to other guys, you reference a common point. Um, you can go on and do that. And so let's go through the, uh, hit the S closely until we get back. Um, and you see, perfect, the 8, 20 miles at 270, step again. The 6, 20 miles at 090, step again. 224, 14.1 nautical miles to the SA4. There's something you're not going to waste a harm on. What a piece of crap that system is. Um, and then uh, the the early warning radar, etc. And all this time, my scan table is going on. Now hit the J, which is going to bring you back to the top priority. Uh -huh. And it says that the bearing is 044... Oops, sorry. That got you back to your uh, waypoint. So hit J again. It's not... Yeah, it's not rejecting for some reason. Okay, so then uh, I may have very well have forgotten it drops down to steer point one. So hit the S until we get back to the... There we go. It disappears and goes to the AI. Notice it says the bearing is 000 at 2 nautical miles. Okay, that is um, not telling you the actual range because it can't derive the range. It's giving you angle indication in the vertical. So when I talk about, hey, the emitter is 2 degrees high, bearing 000, that's because the system's telling me it's 2 degrees high. Yeah. You know, or two degrees low, um, et cetera. And so that was a pretty spiffy uh, calculation. And so that's what the APR 7 present, 47 presented. So the APR 38, which is the system we came with, had what was called the Hawk, the homing and warning computer. Right before the Gulf War and in conjunction with Tape 7000, we got the upgrade that took the 38 into the 47. And so we replaced the computer. It became the WASP, the Weasel Attack Signal Processor, which actually got two signal processors alongside, two threat processors that we never actually fully utilized. Um, but it brought it from a 64K system to a 256K system with 228K subprocessors. This was a big deal. Um, in 1991, and because the software was so memory efficient that it gave us plenty of space. So this was the equivalent of a Commodore computer, and it rocked. It allowed us to do amazing things. We were limited to certain things like 
we could only display numbers, dots, and asterisks, and some things we had to give up. So in the it, it, in earlier tapes, range quality two had been a dot underneath it, and range quality three had been a dot with a triangle over it. But we had to give up those little triangles in order to get more asterisks. So wow. just silly stuff like how many um, displays you can actually get. Uh, how many things you can actually display in terms of how many characters. Um, if you look up at the upper left and you see threat selection, you can you can display up to 15 threats. And you can use the buttons on the left under type to sort. In this case, we've got all selected. Um, we want to see all of the emitters. But you could sort by SAM, AAA, and... It's a Chinese menu here, so it's you know, if you want Sam's and AAA, you hit the Sam and AAA button, and you suppress AIs, whiskeys, X-rays, and others. Um, so that's the APR forty-seven. I think we're done with that. And Just, congratulations on getting a DOS program not only to work but to show up so I can talk. Questions? Just quickly, then you've already—I think you probably already hinted at it—but you talk about uh, watching an Evo do their signals analysis or their emitter analysis. What would your flow be then? Would would you start with this and then you would move to that? Oh, I mean, you, you know, there's a temptation as a, as a as a sort of luddite, which I am, to just say, "Well, this screen is good enough." You know, if if, if it says it's an eleven, um, then it's probably going to be eleven. That why would you? Probably a stupid question, but why would you then go and look at these? I mean, the attack display, yes, because you want to be in the launch acceptable region for the missile, fine. But but why would you look at the um, sort of chopped up um, signals analysis piece? Well, so the LAR was actually displayed on the PPI, um, which we obviously didn't show. Um, it was a bunch of little circles in a big oval kind of pattern um, uh, or that was off-centered. So we, we got a LAR. And that was that was new to the Phantom, right? Having a launch acceptable or a launch allowable region that was that was huge. If it had been a Shrike, it would have given us a couple of range staples. Okay. So a staple looking down, a staple looking up, to be this open kind of container thing. A lot of EWOs did do nothing but look at the PPI. I am not any of those guys, so I'm going to work tactically off the PPI, and if I'm working a target, and I'm going to make the call, I'm working the eleven. And I'll, I'll call it out. And I'm going to make sure that the ID is right. But I'm also listening to it to see if the mode is going to change. And I'm looking at it to see how many beams there on a, are up. Because that will help me refine the threat status. Um, so, for example, an SA-2 has two beams. And if I only see one, then I'm questioning whether it's an SA-2 to begin with. Um, but the audio will tell me, but sometimes if the signal is weak, you might not get good audio. There might be a lot of static in the channel. Um, and you have other reasons to doubt it. If you have, you know, you could say an emitter in the India band, there's a lot of emitters in the India band, uh, and there's a lot of ambiguities. So if you believe that it says a three, all the computer is doing, it's not saying it's a best guess. If it doesn't know, it picks the highest priority threat. And one of the things that that uh, one of the options I selected for the right of tape 9000 was the ability to do a force correlate, whereby if you didn't like what the computer was telling you as terms of what that signal was, you could tell the computer what the signal was. So I'd go into an address plus, you know, 69 plus 177. And uh, then I would tell it that it's emitter number 177. You, you touched on then um, upgrading perhaps a, a system in terms of threat level. So, so this uh, PPI display here then, when it, uh, if I hit, uh, what was it, uh, S to step, so the 11 now is the, what it thinks is the ne next highest threat. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. How, how is it making that determination and and where is, how do you know as an EWO then how confident the system is that that is in the lab? Um, so you don't know how confident the system is. What you know is that this signal meets the frequency PRI and pulse width library entry for the SA-11. And all it is is a lookup table. 
So say, let's say the SA11 is ambiguous with the SA11 and a half. Okay, but the SA11 is higher up on the lookup table than it displays as an SA11. Okay. All right. And would you expect these days with automation, I mean, I mean arguably we, we should be talking about AI, but we won't because we, we don't have time, but would, would you expect then um, these days for aircrew or an EWO to be given uh, a, a sort of level of ambiguity or some indications of what else it might be? Or, or would you would you still expect the system to give you its best guess and then you to do your due diligence afterwards? Yeah, so there's no due diligence options. Most modern radar warning gear, you cannot listen to it. You cannot look at the frequency. You may not get a frequency display. You probably haven't been trained. I mean, you go through UO school, you memorize all these frequencies. I mean, I still know the frequency bands just off the top of my head for a large number of threats because that's what you have to get through UO school. And so... There are no fighter EWOs that get this kind of tool. A rivet joint guy who is looking at his display has even more tools available and is able to do a whole lot more analysis on the actual system. But as far as a fighter goes, no, this is the best it's ever been. Everything post this has been a regression in terms of feeding the information. However... There are certain technological tricks that you can play with the computer. There's a technique called specific emitter identification, which really only works on older systems but um, and requires a really good Intel database. Uh, you can have enough processing power to go a lot more than frequency, PRI, and pulse width. The APR-47 was doing some scan analysis, but it wasn't so much trying to determine what kind of scan it was because that didn't go into its ID criteria. It was trying to determine if that dude had locked on to you. <laughs> and so when I talk about track bars, none of these guys has track bars around it. So I'm not particularly, but if I put a cross around that 11, four spikes going out at the north, south, east, and west, as it were, that guy's tracking me. And the odds are pretty good based on a scan analysis that is tracking me. But the APR-47 did not use a scan analysis for system ID. Um, it might have actually gotten that backwards, or, or not gotten that, but but used the emitter type that it believed it to be to help with its scan analysis. That's how I think it actually worked, to determine whether or not the track bars needed to go up. By and large, track bars came up, you were being tracked. Yeah, the other obvious question then is you've got this, you you mentioned that you can select one, five, ten, or fifteen emitters on the display at any time. Um again, it may be just a counterintuitive question, but is that was that limiting in any way? Did you want to see as an EWO more than the fifteen most pressing or most threatening um emitters on your display? Not really. If there is more than fifteen <laughs> threat emitters on my display at any given time I'm going to be out of harms in about 6 to 9 seconds and it's time to leave uh, and then and then obviously uh, the, the final question is if one of those were launching at you, you just described what you would see if it were tracking you with the crosshairs if they were launching at you would it turn to a circle what, what, what would you see? No, you'd, it would flash at you and you would get audio tones good question Okay. Well, that's that's very interesting. I don't think you'll find anything like that anywhere else on the internet in terms of a, a walkthrough of an unclassified um, piece of official software from the F4G. No, and it's, on it's only because I have my three and a half inch floppy disks from when I was in the 561st at Nellis, and I managed to dig it up and you know actually get this to work on a Mac. So I ran through it last night to make sure that I would see things um, and I could explain it realistically, but you know, you've obviously got it running in a better display format than I had it. So this is perfect. This is exactly what I hope to do. Congratulations on your tech wizardry this time around. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Where to next? Okay. So we've talked about the APR 47 and, you know, previous episodes, particularly wild weasel episodes, talk a lot about the harm. Um, when you do a handoff to a harm, you're pretty much giving the harm the, not only the, the type of of emitter but it's address and department number um and in some cases you know the name of the guy who's operating it and what his hair color is i mean the 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 f4g could really hand off a lot of data and a lot of what got handed off in terms of harm logic was selectable by the ewo 
So we had the ability to um, change bypass logic to take a look at uh, secondary tertiary target lists in a different way to inhibit certain functions to enable certain other functions. So you could all set that up um, the way you wanted to employ the harm. And so that was an enormously capable system. But the other things we trained with, just because, is we trained with shrikes, and guys did shoot shrikes in the Gulf War for entirely stupid reasons. Um, and because, you know, uh, actually a general officer, I believe it was Glenn Proppet, decided that there was too much of a fratricide threat and so instead of using harms, which were long range, you would use strikes, which were sh strikes, which were short range. Although strikes are much greater fratricide because you don't give it the address. You just point it in the direction of something operating in the band of your seeker and let it fly. So once in a, again, another case of general officers interfering with their knowledge base was too low to be useful. But we also practiced with mavericks and cluster bombs and dumb bombs and we would do these regularly at Nellis so there are plenty of simulators up at Nellis some of the simulators are manned and so they're run with guys because they're used as a training aid so if they capture you they want to see your defensive maneuvers they tape all this um a lot of the tape is unclassified um unless they you end up some of the simulators actually have a receiver uh, that might put uh, data on the scope, like the effectiveness of your jamming or what your jamming looks like, those become classified. Um, but without a jammer in, in, in place, you can end up with a bunch of unclassified video. Um, although I've only ever seen a couple of those. Uh, but you see the guys, and you see the guys flying across Nevada, and this is a debrief tool. Did you maneuver appropriately? Did you get behind a range line? Were you aware of the threat? I mean, there's plenty of threats where the the, the guy films a striker coming in and the striker is task saturated and just gets obliterated. Um, and so we would practice against those guys with dumb ordnance. And, you know, we would practice low-level bomb attacks or we would practice Maverick and we'll show you some of the Maverick. But one of my favorite attacks, this is an SA-8 simulator. Dude's out there with an SA-8, and we come in and we split our two F-4Gs. And one comes in, uh, one and two come in from entirely different directions. We're like 120 degrees out. Nice. And the plan is that the SA-8 simulator is probably going to engage one of us. That guy will go defensive, and the other one will continue to run in. That's exactly what happens. I think I'm number two. Number one goes defensive. They've got him on the tape. He's jinking and jiving. He survived the shot. And one of the things, you can actually hear the operator voice in the simulator because sometimes that's a debrief tool. And what you hear is, all right, that shot's a miss. Where's the other guy? And you hear, whoosh, as we blow over the top of them at the uh, minimum safe altitude, simulating a whole bunch of Kansas CBU. So, God, I wish I had that tape because that was awesome. We just uh, snuck in from the back. Now, the reality is that an SA-8 platoon actually has four SA-8s. <laughs> um, and so we might have uh, uh, might have been really vulnerable. But one of the other weapons we'd use, the theory was Maverick. You can use Maverick. Maverick is fire and forget, right? And you don't have to get that close. Well, actually, you have to get ridiculously close. So do I have permission to share? Yes, you do. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to bring up Oh, you just disabled it. What? There you go. Try again. All right. Let's do quick time share. You should see a totally blank display. Okay. Yep. All right. So we're going to run this up. Now, this is an accident. The reason I have this tape, and it's unfortunate because I don't have my shot, is that we obviously re use our tapes. It's three-quarter inch Betamax, these are unclassified tapes because all they're filming is the radar. They don't film any of the APR-47 stuff. That's a separate system called a CONRAC, which was classified. So these are all unclass. And what we had done is taken one of our tapes and given it to the video guys to consolidate a bunch of our live Maverick shots on the yellow on the Nellis ranges. And then put it on this tape. And after we washed them, we put this back in the recycle pool. So I actually flew my last flight 
which was a 2v1 ACM flight, and I taped over, you know, the, the air-to-air engagements, I taped over this. But when I was watching it after digitizing it years later, I went beyond the end of my flight to see what else was on it, and I got half a dozen Maverick shots. Nice. So why not? We'll share it. So Major Mike McKenna, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Steve Hampton. Steve Hampton is hoser. He's the funniest guy ever. Best storyteller. I mean, I am a mere Padawan compared to him. Uh, and I hope to get him on uh, eventually. But uh, Hoser in the back, McKenna in the front. Hoser's doing a lot of talking, and you're going to hear a lot of it's important on this shot because of what he's going to tell you and the the information exchange that has to go on. I think these were all Okay, so let's talk about what's happening. The targets are an array of simulated tanks. What they actually are are little plywood shacks big enough to put a big-ass electric blanket on. Okay, and so I'm not kidding. These are heated up with queen or king size electric blankets plugged into an extension cord up on the Nellis range. <laughs> uh, because you need high contrast and you don't want anybody to miss when they're shooting a live Maverick, right? This is more of a feel good kind of thing. And so as you look at this display, it's down on our radar scopes. So the pilot sees it up front and the Ewo sees it down underneath the hood. Um, pretty much, you know, looking down at the display. And this is the same scope that we looked the radar on. We've just turned it to TV uh, mode, whereby we're seeing through the Maverick Seeker. And, and is this, a, I don't know my Mavericks well, is this a D model uh, imaging for us? These are all, we all shot, I think we shot Ds and Gs on this run. Yeah. Um, And the Gs have a big warhead. That's, they're emotionally satisfying. But it is an IR seeker. It's the same IR seeker on the AGM 130, the same IR seeker on the SLAM. This IR seeker gets a lot of use, and it's not really that great. But it's it's a one-time use seeker, 1980s technology. And for all of that, it's not bad. Um, well, just, to, let me just ask really quickly then. So so it's exactly the same seeker as on the AGM 130, not a derivative of of the, the AGM 130 is not a derivative of the Seeker that has therefore been improved or whatever that are you saying there it exactly has same? been improved the SLAM and the AGM 130 have improvements but it's all in the processing behind the Seeker not in the Seeker itself okay. the camera is the same and the the cameras on the uh, on the training missiles are actually degraded because the nose of the missile um, is a transparent IR transparent covering, and it degrades over time. In a real one, a real one has a protective cover over the front of the missile when you load it. And then uh, when you first call up the video, a little 22 caliber round blows the protective cover off. Oh, wow. Um, and then you get the, a much better looking imager because your window is not degraded. So the training shots are always a little worse um, than these are. And so, but what this looks like, I remember it looking, you know, is there double rows of tanks and uh, you don't get a great lock on indication, but the backseater is going to lock it on. And at this point, we've uh, hoser's already gotten a lock. And there is a cross, which you, there's this big cross, but there's a tiny little cross, which if it flashes, you have a lock, but the lock is not going to survive launch. So you're going to hear a lot of these guys talk about the flashing cross. They're waiting for the flashing cross to go away. When it goes away, it's like, I have a good lock. Now you can shoot it. And the, the word, the code word for shooting is rifle. We actually have one guy say Magnum out of habit. But the shot call is rifle, and at that point, the screen's going to go blank because your missile just left. So let's run through uh, Hoser's shot. Lost another shot for three miles. We know that it's left. And the ball. Yeah, you go. All the trickle down. That's that right. I'm watching the channel. Got a control. Backseater's calling the range. 
because we, of course, have this in a steer point. He refers to the keyhole. So there is actually, there is very little space around the center of the crosshairs that the Maverick can be shot in. And it's roughly the shape of a keyhole, but there's no actual keyhole displayed on the scope. So you know it's out of the keyhole if it's off to the side and the cross doesn't steady up. It's just flashing. <laughs> and, but since, and that's why we take all these shots nicely steadied up. That shot's taken inside three miles. He, he said, I can, I'm, I'm watching the shadow. I, just to be clear, is this being, this is obviously being, well, it could be shot during the day, couldn't it? But I'm guessing in the heat of the desert, you, you're shooting this at night and the shadow no, is coming from. these are all from, day shots. Oh, it's from the day shot. Okay. Right. Yeah, nine to five range guys. <laughs> all right. right? And, and, you know, again, it's a hot range. And I think these were in May. Um, We'll see a scope. Okay. Uh, Pat Pence and Steve Brown. Uh, Marble and Brownie. This is a, this is another set of good com, and and these two guys were crewed a lot, um, and so it you can tell on the crew coordination, um, you know, guys who are used to working with each other and are are comfortable with it and have a good information exchange. So I guess March ninety four. Let's see. This is in wide field of view. They're going to shoot at a narrow. When they shoot in narrow, it just zooms in a bit and those, those little brackets go away. So the brackets define what your narrow field of view is going to look like when you select it. Uh, and this is the longest, I think, of the tape shots because Brownie got the tape on, on the turn in and in the the pattern in the bombing pattern, you basically turn in at 13 miles from the target. Yeah, we're being blacked out now. 13 miles, 39. Okay, then I'm like direct TV back in idle. Eating, flying the gun cross to the red radical. Pretty tight. I am now back up there. That's a 17,000 and a half mile. Going to get out there, but we'll move it up and try to get to my clock. That's a lot. Okay. Seven and a half miles. Look that. I'm tracking at 13.5. Airspeed 436. Okay. What to the place? Uh, I do that. Six miles. The target. Good. And the pickle button. Come close to steady clock. Five clock. No. Oh, steady clock. Five miles. I'm out crack. Five things. Five things. Five things. Ready, ready. Rifle. Season one's rifle. Season one, four mile shot. Okay, and there's not a whole lot of ID going on, right? We have we know the pattern. We know on the pattern which target each of us is supposed to hit, and we're looking for electric blankets. If that had been a SAM and a bunch of support vehicles, that would have been a much harder ID problem. So their wingman, Caesar two, is uh John Fanning with uh JT in the back seat. Um, JT has actually come from uh, uh, the Philippines. He was one of the Philippine weasels. This is uh, another follow-on assignment. He's one of the few guys we got um, who had Philippine time. By the time we got to the 561st, there were a couple more. Um, John Fanning later went to uh, 117s after this assignment. Yeah, I'm going to find a nice map. Going again. That's I'm not going to like that. Okay. So I'm going to go on things. Okay. Speed the spray. Got good length. Get back there. Speed the fuel. In hot. Back to the Got good length. Go back here. Right here. 
Does it have a ground stabilized I... mode? Say again, so, Steve. So, so th I, I noticed then in the previous two, there's no sort of ground stabilization. So they can't sort of stabilize it on a point on the ground and then slew the cursor around uh, to find, to pick a target of interest. Is this always then bore sighted to the aircraft's nose? It's bore sighted to the aircraft nose unless you are doing an attack on an emitter under the diamond, in which case you can do a, a mode where you will slew the Maverick to the emitter. Um, which is an F4G unique capability. Um, and you can actually hear the launch warning has gone off twice. We're up in the 70 series ranges, so there's a bunch of simulators around us, and it's entirely possible somebody's playing with us. I mean, they could be doing anything. We could be a target of opportunity. They could be training a new guy. But the APR-47 is given a launch warning. We don't care. This is non-tactical. This is you have live ordnance, and the guys are by the numbers. This is the range, this is the altitude, this is the airspeed, because we don't have a HUD to record all this. Mm. So they have to dictate it into the tape, and you know they're going through the procedures because you do not want to screw up your live missile shot. I think on the previous one, he mentioned the Red Cross. So is that pointing to a point on the ground, or is that pointing to um, an Arnie 101 steer point, or what, what is that? Ah, so the the Red Cross are combining last. It's like our Pipper. It is our Pipper. So okay. when you're in an air to ground mode with a station selected, um, that's your Pipper. Um, but it, um, and the Green Cross is where the emitter under the the hammer is. Hi. Okay. We're seven and a half miles. I got a flight across. Don't point out. Got a steady cross? No, flying again. Point Hey, no. No flight. Ready, ready. Now you hear them say, hold the pickle button, right? So this is a, what you don't want to do is what we call a quick pickle, where you just hammer down on the pickle button and release. Then you can end up with a hung missile. You want to actually hit the pickle button and hold on to that until that little steam train leaves your rail. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another thing they briefed us about. Do not quick pickle. All right, Captain Coolhand, a guy I don't think I ever got to fly with because we we're on alternate... Uh, uh, rotations and ray valley ray valley was an e-model guy that came over to the weasels um another you know very experienced instructor extremely dry extremely laid back taught me a lot um but a guy who you know like patio and skip jacoby these are guys who were just so good with all the other stuff um that they were you know models to emulate Pepper, pepper. Capture. Gone now. Yeah, I got a really good look at this guy. I'm driving a little bit. Yeah. Four blocks. Wow. Got a planting star. All right. Uh, wait for the gun. Patty. Great point, I think. Ready? You're clear. Yeah, all right. All right. So that was a quick shot. They turned in there at, there at only a handful of miles rather than the 13 miles. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Alex Franco and Steve Garland, um, Judy Garland, uh, Judy retired as a brigadier general, um, really good EWO. One of the few, there are plenty of EWOs I respect. There are very few that I look up to. Judy Garland's one of them. Um, and Alex is actually, uh, I think he's still chief of safety down at Eglin Air Force Base. I saw him doing a flight test mm, a year and a half ago, two years ago. That was kind of fun. Uh, both, you know, excellent dudes, uh, highly capable. Our clarity shoot. Right there. Right there. Alex. Okay, so that was less exciting, but this is more 
uh, exciting. This is the shot from the other, from the wingman, who's looking through their Maverick and filming the shooting. Cool. Oh, we've got a couple of those complete with commentary. Uh, this is a misspelling, you know, by the by the guys that put the tape together. It's Lieutenant Colonel Juas, J O U A S, Jean Marc Juas. Um, Juice, great dude, retired as Lieutenant General. Chris Chalales. Chris Chalales is another pretty good EWO, um, Lieutenant in the Storm. Uh, as I recall, he's from Queens. Uh, never lets anybody forget that. Uh, he's also the guy that is the source of the quote. The last thing we need is Star Baby with fewer inhibitions. Um, and so this is their shot. Oh, it's up. Yeah, right here, Claire. Are they popping to roll in on the target? Okay, coming down. Look, I'm putting parts. Five miles. Now we need to I got a turn up here. Hold. Okay, stop. I'm aiming at the left of, left of vehicles. Okay. There's a pair of them. One short, one long. Okay. And I'm going for a long. Right. Lock. Steady crawl. Where to fire? Where to fire? Absolutely. Right. Oh, complete with sound effects and the chase shot. Awfully cool. There it goes. Good shot. Uh, John Prost Hans, uh, Wendell, uh, Captain Brescia. Jeez, I can't remember Brescia's uh, call sign. Uh, he was, he would bring the award. If there were an award for most sarcastic, smartass Ewo ever, he would be a contender. Um, he was really good at his job. Um, but I didn't realize that for a number of years because he was such a smartass and because I didn't actually get to deploy with him and I didn't uh, uh, see him uh, in operation. For you to call somebody a smartass, that's... that's... I, I, I'm not even in his league. <laughs> you know, uh, he could look in his smartass rearview mirror and he wouldn't even see me. Now, we have to go a little bit farther away. Go farther away. There we go. Hey, I'm going to take the farther one. Got two miles. Got on. Wait, you got it. Clear to fire. Going. He's right. Clear. Snap. Pop it up. Pick it up. You got blue. Nice shot, man. See that guy, Tank? Was that Black Hawk? Look at the chase. That was that a black hot rather than white hot? I think it was black hot. Yeah. All right. So that's where we're going to wrap this up. Um, stop share. Because any more Maverick shots will be boring, but if we have a last one, we can throw it in the version three just for the heck of it. Um, so there we go, Mavericks. And you will notice that the range is ridiculously short. And if we talk about our notional short range air defense threat being an SA 8, we'll call its tactical range six miles just for the heck of it. We're shooting inside three. Mm -hmm. um, by the time you get to three miles, you're at 18,000 
feet. And, you know, some of these shots, you heard it on one of the chase, man, that was close. So the min range is 10 times your true airspeed. So, okay. and you have to know the min range because you are you can be pushing it. So uh, if you're at 500 knots, one of the guys smoking in 500 knots, 5,000 foot minimum range. Now, Marble and Brownie, they're not smoking in. He says he's at 420-ish knots. They're playing the game. He's not only giving the Ewo more time, but he's making the mid-range closer to the target. As it turns out, they don't need it. Uh, but, you know, that was that was not an accident that they were slow. That was part of the plan. But what was, was there any utility then for Maverick on F4G? So it was good What's training. It? Um, and we did manage, somebody managed to put a Maverick through an observatory in northern Iraq. Uh, but at that point, if you're carrying Maverick around, it's because kind of the threat has dropped so low and the emitter environment is so thinned out that you feel you can do without a harm loadout. And I have trouble imagining those kind of conditions where you can apply that in the real world, where you're going to risk a high value asset like an F4G uh, putting Mavericks. I see it much more likely that an F4G would help locate something uh, or somebody would take off already knowing where a site was and take it with Mavericks rather than doing Hunter Killer. Um, but it was definitely a capability and we had additional system mechanization to help us target emitters that nobody else had is this a good juncture i'm sure we've talked about it before but i don't know if we've ever really sort of just got your condensed thoughts on it um it's, it's kind of been a subject that that's been there but rather than rather than directly addressed but destruction of enemy air defenses versus suppression of enemy air defenses so it sounds like the optimum loadout from your point of view for an f4g would be four um agm 88s more if you could have carried them um, before AGM 88, and then once you shot those off, that's your mission done, back to base to rearm, refuel, come back and do it again. Um, the destruction of enemy air, air defense mission then, how, how did you feel about that? Where did that sit in the mission set for the F4G? Um, where did it fit in in a, camp, in a campaign? Was it you know based on who you were protecting, you know, what they were trying to do? What, 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 talk, tell us about those two things. So the Harms Warhead weighs about 146 pounds, fragment and explosive included. Uh, it's not that big a warhead, and it's not designed uh, to... It's designed to take a system off the air. It's not really designed for a catastrophic kill, although it can get and has gotten catastrophic kills. It's a suppressive weapon. It's designed to take the dude offline. Um, and because it's targeting radar antennas, it's optimized for targeting radars. But it was expected that that guy could potentially be repaired and come back. So the suppression mission is a something you have to apply over and over and over again. It's like cheap paint on an exterior fence. You just have to repaint all the time. Whereas destruction, you take the guy off the table and you you know you flick that pawn right off the chessboard. It goes slamming into the wall and it's done. So there's a place for it, but it's not necessarily the F4G's job, even though it was equipped for it and we trained to do it. Because you can give the destruction job potentially to somebody else um, if necessary, but it's still in the menu. It was a tool we could do, and other people might feel differently about how important destruction was, but from an air campaign standpoint... Um, if I'm, if I'm queuing up an F4G for a destruction mission, then that's unavailable to do suppression pretty much on that mission. Mm. And I might, you know, it, it may be an inappropriate use of my limited assets. So if I had very few SAMs and a whole bunch of weasels, multiple weasel squadrons around, I could see going for it. But even so, I would have a destruction two ship being covered by a suppression two ship. What, what about, so one thing... There's the, obviously a strong focus here on the uh, surface-to-air missile sh short-range um, air defense capabilities. Uh, you just talked about being inside, well, three miles or so to shoot the Maverick. You started this call by talking about the Shulker 
uh, ZSU 23, 24, and how those tore up uh, the Israelis um, during Yom Kippur. What, what then, wh where did they fit into the, that piece then? What sort of range would you expect uh, a Shilka to have if you're, if you're going to be perhaps rolling in and shooting that close to something? I would expect his tactical effective range to be between 11 and 17,000 feet. So almost three nautical miles. And that effective range might very well be longer if you're pointing at the guy. Okay, because if you're pointing at it, so George Acree, former sink wild weasel, Vietnam weasel, told me years ago that one of the dumbest things he'd ever done was flak suppression, was trying to duel against guns, that he'd lost a lot of friends doing it. He was thinks it was the stupidest mission that he ever did, and he would never recommend that anybody do that. Flak suppression is a loser's game. Um, and so if you can do the Shilka with a harm, well and good, but your better idea is to locate it and stay away from it, uh, rather than trying to go Maverick, because uh, one of the things with doing a direct attack on a Sam is you solve all his angle problems for him. Yeah. And now, you know, he's got an elevation and range. And if you're smoking in a low altitude to duel with a gun, you've solved his elevation program too. All he's got to, and, and there are shilka modes you know you can go optical track with range only on the radar which is a very difficult mode to jam because you're not doing any radar tracking um and just let them come to you and shilkas are nasty in that particular mode so um i think it's a, i think george was right bad idea Okay, let let me come back briefly then, because we I, I want to let you get on with your narrative. But but come back briefly then to the perennial question of low level. We've talked about this. You and I have talked about this several times. Um, you know, it fits into the conversation around the dependence on low observability, whether or not you can come in smoking in at medium altitude against a double digit SAM threat. But if you go in low level, then and the guns are that effective, what what does that mean? Um, what does that mean in terms of what? It means well, in that... In terms of if it's valid. Is it a valid tactic still? It's, it, what you're doing with low level is you're trying to avoid guns, not necessarily kill them. You want to generate a high line of sight rate. You want to use terrain to uh, cause a masking problem. You want to use you know indirect terrain masking where the terrain is behind you um, to cause a clutter problem. Uh, and you want to limit your exposure. And so all of that makes... Uh, low altitude important. One of the things about RF low observability stealth is it always works to some extent, but it's still the radar range equation, right? And one of the entries of the radar range equation is your radar cross section. Well, you find when you start crunching the numbers that if you get really close to a guy, and these are not necessarily low power radars because they wanted to make them resistant to jamming. So your gun radars, you know, you might throw more power than. Uh, then you strictly need to detect a target because that's a way of improving your jamming resistance. It's just more power. That also affects the radar range equation. It's one of the other variables. So you'll find when you do the math, um, and I've I, I know this because I've done the math. You know, uh, once you get up close into a short range air defense air defense system, you have to be ridiculously low RCS in order to not be seen by that guy, and you're probably not that low. Where it might get you a value is if you're low and you don't have terrain to hide behind, like you're low and flat, or like you're over the ocean, and then you can deny an earlier detection, which would cue and get that gun on to you, um, is one of those, those particular issues. So... It doesn't matter what your radar cross-section is if you put a hill between you and the radar. Yeah. Difficult to argue with that. Yep. All right. What to next? Okay, so let's talk about Nellis. 561st Fighter Squadron Nellis, we were the last great fighter squadron, and I know that because it said so on our shirts. And we were stood up at Base X technically in 1992. And I volunteered to get out of Spangdalem, even though Germany was great. The 81st was not a healthy squadron. And so I got out, volunteered to be initial cadre in Nellis, and we went off to Nellis, which was then called Base X. We weren't supposed to know we were going to Nellis. Although when the household goods guys 
show up to pick up your stuff, even though your orders say base X with a code, they know where it's going because they have to figure out how your household goods are getting there. So, you know, base X is Nellis. Everybody knows it's Nellis. We have to refer to it as base X. And that's going to be the last F4G active duty wild weasel squadron. The guard squadron is going to be at uh, the guard squadrons. There's a training squadron and an op squadron at Boise. And so we go off and I arrive in late December after taking 30 days of leave, late December in 1992, got time to get house shopping done, everything else, because we have no airplanes and we have no squadron and we've got Jack. So 12 guys, including our commander, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Costantini is going to be the weasel squadron commander. And we have two, three rooms on the second floor of the Red Flag building. And so we're trying to get the squadron ready. They're try- Nellis guys are trying to clean out a building so we can have a place for ops and maintenance. That eventually happens. And we get one aircraft and then two aircraft. And I think our one of our first aircraft was one of the MiG killers. I can't remember whether it's 277 or 235. Uh, but So we start getting our proficiency flights, get back in... Uh, which is what you could do with the one weasel. But we had the Nellis Ranges, so we're flying up there, we're looking at emitters, we're getting used to the airplane again. But we have a red star on the side of our airplane. And we're the only one on the flight line with a red star. And because we taxi with the canopies open, because we have no air conditioning, Dave Lucia, Santa, and the mandatory addendum here is one of my favorite pilots. As he, we taxi by the weapon school every single time, left side, taxiing to uh to runway 21 which is a normal takeoff runway he's got his gloved finger outside the spitter plate tapping pointing at the red star every time we pass the weapon school i thought was awesome because we don't close the canopies till we actually take the runway and we're cleared for takeoff and uh, we start to gather we start getting our other people in and one of my favorite events was Elaine McDonald's arrival. So Elaine McDonald was uh, Airman First Class coming out of the Intel School. And the Weasel Squadron is very tough on Intel folks. Because you come in, you come out of Goodfellow Air Force Base, you've just studied, you know, all you could study about the threat, and you're supposed to brief these Weasel guys on the threat. We know way more than (laughs) any Intel person coming in is likely to know. And half of our intel people rise to the occasion and half of them just break because it's a low job satisfaction job because you're not doing anything. And the ones that did well are the ones that said, "Okay, I'm not as well prepared for this job as I thought I was going to be. I will become better prepared. And so Elaine was one of those people. She was sassy. Um, She was smart and she was also stunning. So when she arrived in the squadron, she comes into Red Flag and she can't get into the building. I have to go down to get her. She shows up. Somebody has played a trick on her and said, show up in Class A's. So she shows up in Class A's and she looks great in Class A's. She's getting whistles as she comes into the building, which was unacceptable then, even more so than now. And I go down to meet her and um, it's awesome. And I just have an ear to ear grin because I'm going to walk her up and introduce her to our commander, which I do, and he looks at her and he walks in the room and he goes, oh no. Because (laughs) all he can see is a young airman who is going to get attention from uh, everybody with the appropriate sexual orientation. And, and, you know, in a male-dominated squadron, you know, maintenance, I mean, the whole deal. And he views her as uh, as a big problem. When we when she first, we were spinning her up, you know, getting her used to the squadron. People would not be alone in the closed room because we feared, you know, the the possibilities. Now there was there was you know really nothing to fear. Elaine was one of our our greatest assets. Um, she's still at Nellis doing uh, doing test work. But that was one of the things I definitely remember from the early squadron is me with this giant grin walking in to introduce Airman McDonald to the squadron commander. It was a great time. And so we gradually get more people. We get more airplanes. Most of the people were getting the flown weasels before. We do put a couple folks through a requal course at Boise, and then they come to us. We didn't really do local requal, but a lot of the folks came out of the 
35th wing at George, which was closing, and the 52nd wing at Spang, which was closing, so we didn't have to re-qualify them. We just had to get them recurrent. Uh, and that's how most of our crews went. We were, ended up being the biggest squadron in the Air Force. Normal squadron is 24 jets and X number of maintenance people. We had 300 and some odd maintenance folks. We had more than 24 jets because we had to maintain home base operations in two deployed locations all the time. One of the things that had started at the Cobar Towers, which I didn't mention in the first episode, is the weasel hostage crisis sign. So there had been, during the Iranian hostage crisis, U.S. news organizations every day, you went to your evening news, because remember, this is, you know, broadcast news, and it would say weasel hostage crisis with a day, or, or hostage crisis with a day on it, and eventually went up to 777. I think this is Spike Benichek at work, puts up a big plywood sign on the seventh floor of the Coburn Fire Towers that says weasel hostage crisis, and they start counting up the days. We got to 1,900 and some odd days, and I was on the last deployment, even though I didn't stay till the very end to Cobar Towers. And Jim Yukon had come in because he's the squadron commander, and he goes, man, it's a real pity we're not going to make it to 2,000. And everybody looks at him and he goes, what am I saying? No, it's not. <laughs> but we were close to 2,000 days of the hostage crisis. So we kept that rotation going. We supported Insulik Turkey. We still had contingency. We're always on a string for the Balkans, although that string was never fully pulled. So it's a squadron that is always going. And we have to do upgrades. But we have a very experienced squadron. We could put together a four ship where um, you have 16,000 flying hours in the four ship easy that would have been a piece of cake you know i was one of the low time guys um and so we're deployed we're when we're at home we're flying on the nellis ranges we fly in every red flag what used to be called the weapon school had the mission employment phase which is their graduation expert uh, exercise the me phase we'd fly in every me fa phase we'd fly weapon school support the only people we didn't support on that base fly with or against were the thunderbirds obviously and, you know, we were down far in the totem pole, right? Because we were the last in line to get the range space and we would often only get a teeny tiny corner of range space. But we got it and we went out to China Lake. Um, but most of the emitters we used were up on the Nellis range space. And we, it was a lot of good flying and a lot of good training. And even if you were the bastard stepchildren, uh, we had a WA tail code, Weapon School Alpha, instead of what we should have had, which was a WW tail code. Am I still bitter about that? Yes. Uh, and we had to go with WA because the wing commander at the time was a dick. Um, but since he was fired for entirely different reasons, um, I don't feel bad about it. You know, karma is a bitch. And I actually blame his firing not on the mishaps on the base, but on the fact that he he disturbed the karma gods in terms of our phantom tail code. We had a great supply of parts. We had maintainers. We had you know, like chiefs who'd been working the F-4 for 28 years. I mean, these guys were amazing. We had the highest mission-capable rate of any squadron, despite flying a lot of flying hours. But one of the other things about being in the Phantom Squadron is air shows. So in the United States, we have a bunch of uh, people do air shows all the time, all over the U.S., and they will often request DOD support. And so there's this master list for Department of Defense support. And um, people will say request. And what we got was a list. And so what happens is I'm in the weapon shop. I'm safe. I'm an EWO. I'm in the weapon shop. I'm where I want to be. I was a training officer at Spangdalem. And Steve Hampton is the acting squadron commander, Hoser. And you'll hear from him again. And Hoser decides that scheduling is not working, and he fires everybody on the ops and maintenance side and decides to fix schedule. He's going to put a bunch of new maintainers in, and the three guys he taps to now enter the scheduling shop are Stamp Walden, Chris Chalales, and me. Okay? Bastard. I mean, what a dick move that was. Especially because Stamp and Chili immediately deploy then so now I'm a one-person scheduling shop with a bunch of new folks on the maintenance side, and I'm busy, and I'm not getting the kind of flying hours I want because there are certain types of schedulers. Some guys will use the scheduling position to, to grab all the good sorties. I'm not that guy. 
I will use my position to get all the upgrades that need to be done. But also air shows. I'm the only scheduler. We are going to support a bunch of air shows because we are using it as a reward system for our air crews and maintenance. Um, because it's a reward for maintenance guys to go out on government funding, go to an air base, and all they really have to do is catch the airplane, take the weekend off, and launch the airplane the following morning. So they get a rental car and a hotel room all paid for, they get per diem, and they're in whatever town we happen to have the air base on. The F-4, declining number of squadrons, we are in high, high demand. And the rule was, Jim Yukon's rule was, you had to be able to get out there in one hop. Because he didn't want the airplanes to break on the way. As many hops as necessary to get back, but you had to get out there in one hop. Well, we have tankers. And every tanker unit in the country needs to fill their F-4 tanking squares for the half. So I never had a problem scheduling tankers. So, you know, air show, we're at Nellis, go to Massachusetts, fine. So what I did is I would take the, the at the beginning of the summer, I would take the list of approved air shows... And I would put it up and I would see if we could get four air crew to sign on that weekend, we would support that air show. Um, and it was that simple. And so we would, um, and I got first look, by the way, because I generate the list. And so I would sign up for the air shows, really, I wanted to go on and then I'd post the list is how I kind of <laughs> see to remember it might have gone. And so we did some good ones. And uh, one of the, the air shows was Julia Lee's air show. And uh, this goes back to some of the deployments, and I'll tell that story later. But when we're competing for air shows, you want to go to not Air Force bases. Air Force base air shows suck because they won't let you sell squadron prints and T-shirts. They're uptight. They're going to put you on base. They may not give you a rental car. They're, you know, they're not going to give you good pretty M. And, you know, the 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 base leadership is going to be all over you about everything. Standards, where you parked your car, you know, how clean the jet is, whether or not you're dripping on their ramp. Nobody needs that. So you try not to go to U.S. Air Force bases. You go to civilian fields and National Guard bases or Navy bases. Navy bases are a bonus because when you call to make reservations, you say, I'm Captain Petruca. And on a Navy base, Captain <laughs> is a big deal. They don't ask your service. They immediately assign you high priority and distinguished visitors quarters. So Navy bases are a bonus. But where I ended up with a conundrum is if I had two air shows on the same weekend where I'd gotten guys to sign up for them because now I needed to make them compete. So one day I have two air shows, Syracuse, New York, which is a guard base, Hancock Field, and Westover Air Reserve Base, in Massachusetts, in Amherst, Massachusetts, a college town. And I don't have anything to distinguish them. I mean, so I call up, and what I normally did in this case is I want to know how much the airfield is providing, because we have limited travel funds. So if they're providing the queues, I'm not burning per diem. If they're providing rental cars, we're not burning rental car money and gas money. So if I can reduce the cost to the squadron, that's my consideration, is I just want this cost reduced so that we can do more air shows so we can send more maintenance guys out. So I, I do my standard. I'm talking to the Westover guys, and and I say, okay, so what's in it for us? And the guy goes, we will meet you at the airplane in a limousine full of beer and naked women. And that is such a great lie. I mean, that's just a complete lie. But it's so blatant, and it's so good. I say, you're getting a two-ship, and I'm going to be in it. And so... You know, I and actually Syracuse, we decided to double up. We also sent one to Syracuse in the same weekend. So they didn't lose out because, you know, I mean, they're guard guys. They have to be good liars. They just didn't think of this one. So um, they we sent out two, but we take a tanker. You know, the tankers actually wait for us because we're a little late. We launch as early as we can in the morning, but we have the East Coast, West Coast time thing. So we go out, we refuel from the guys from, uh, uh, I think, Birmingham, Alabama. And then we get pick up some guys out of Pittsburgh and we fly all the way and we land at Westover Air Reserve Base, Amherst, which I've never heard of. It's a C-5 base. And we pull in and we stop and we shut down and a black Cadillac Fleetwood limousine pulls up to the airplane. <laughs> and I finish the post flight and I walk up and I open the back door 
and inside there are coolers full of iced bottled beer. And being the kind of guy I am, I looked at him and I said, where are the women? And what the guy explained was, is what they had as the greeting crew, is they had, there's a local gentleman's club called St. Anthony's in Amherst. And they had some of the women from St. Anthony's who were over in the morning to catch the crews that came in early. But in the afternoon, they'd all gone home and you know, to take a nap because they were expecting a high dollar night. Because that apparently is what happens at air shows at a gentleman's club. So it was not a lie. And the other bonus about Westover is this is one of the bases that the Australians will always show up at. I don't know why, but traditionally Westover gets a Australian C-130. And you would think, how attractive can an Australian C-130 be? And I would say, mm, normally not that attractive unless you're into kangaroo insignia, except that the annual Aussie C-130 typically shows up with a case, not a case, a pallet, a pallet load of Foster's Lager in the back of the airplane. And the way they run this is that when the air show closes at 5 o'clock, the C-130 becomes the aircrew bar. Awesome. So that's the other Westover tradition, is the Aussie flying aircrew bar. And as a Commonwealth country, they're you know, honor bound to compete with the Brits as raging alcoholics. Now I never, I have no interest whatsoever in Foster's or any other form of beer. So I never went into the air crew bar. Um, and I had friends from college who were actually out at UMass. So, um, you know, I was otherwise busy, but that was, you know, one of the great air shows was Westover reserve base. The other great air show was Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is not going to be my first pick. Um, it was the home of an F-16 guard squadron in Fort Smith, Arkansas. But the reason we're going to go there goes back to one of our early deployments. So in 1994, I spent 210 days deployed out of the year. Two deployments to Turkey. Um, they were fairly decent deployments, although there's a major tragedy involved with one, which I'll talk about after I... Uh, we're going to talk about after I do the air show. Let's interrupt the air show because I don't like to end on bad notes and you have limited time. So let's talk about the 1994 deployments. I'm now managing to get on the Insulik Turkey cycle instead of the Dahran Saudi Arabia cycle. And Insulik rocks. It's definitely the base you want to deploy from. It has alcohol. It has good shopping. You can get off base. We did a lot of exploration in that area of Turkey. And for a guy who's a castle fanatic, that's fantastic. Um, a lot of castle influences, uh, Arab, Frank, and Armenian. I didn't know the Armenians were big castle designers, but I know it now. And so we'd go out to castles. You know, the Turks liked us. We got along with them really well. You know, guys could buy carpets. Um, you could buy Iranian carpets. Um, in Turkey, they're embargoed in the U.S., so you can't normally get them. Uh, but you would buy Iranian carpets, and often guys would issue a fake certificate saying that it was Turkish. Really? Yes, that's how you get it back in the U.S., uh, is with a fake certificate of authenticity. Unless you're a tar carpet dude, you can't tell the difference anyway. Carpet guys can tell the difference at a glance. Um, but, you know, because they don't see a lot of Iranian carpets, how would you know if you were a customs agent, even if you even check it out? Why would you even unroll it? So, you know, carpets, brassworks, woodwork, jewelry, as I mentioned, uh, Yilmaz jewelry used to produce little F4-shaped earrings. Um uh, which you could give as a gift to your spousal unit. And Turkey's great operationally. It is the gentleman's no-fly zone. It is not enforced 24 hours a day. It is a couple days a week, only during daylight hours, not on Thursdays and Fridays, um, and uh, not on like the day after Super Bowl Sunday. You also have, in 1994, the French are still there. They're providing the reconnaissance capability with either F1s or JAGs, depending uh, and as previously mentioned, French Air Force detachments come with an issue of one red bottle of red wine per person per day. And then you had the Royal Air Force. So the purpose of the French Air Force in the joint contribution is to do reconnaissance and to provide red wine. The purpose of the Royal Air Force in an operation like this is to consume all the alcohol in the immediate vicinity, set things on fire, and provide humor. So... 
we, the officers, the, the enlisted were in Tenth City. And don't think that Tenth City by 1994 is that bad a deal. These are air-conditioned tents with plywood floors, okay, little miniature movie theaters, plenty of electrical supply. We didn't have internet yet, so that wasn't an issue. Um, and they're actually pretty decent facilities. And you could go to the self-help store, get plywood and two-by-fours, and improve your tent any way you wanted. So a lot of tents had been steadily improved deployment after deployment, plus the civil engineers had like a branch office right there, um, which is good when you are when you need to fill sandbags, which we'll get to that too. And so we're there, and for down days when you're not flying the next day, there's at least a couple parties a month, and party number one is the red wine party, and then the Brits or the Americans would focus, because even the French can't drink one bottle of red wine per person per day, but they don't want to admit that they can't do it, because that might cut off the supply, so they have a, a, a party. And, of course, the Brits are going to get hammered. And so a couple events, one that happened before I got there, so I only got it secondhand. I don't like to tell secondhand stories, but I'm going to tell this one, because we still had the aftermath of the three burned trees in the quads. Officers were in bachelor officer quarters. There's like dorms. There, it's a, it's a room with a kitchenette and your own bathroom. You have your Turkish Batman who will do your laundry and polish your boots for, you know, uh, pennies. You know, single dollars. Um, keep the room clean and everything else. And that was considered a desirable job. And those guys were good. Um, plus they were great sources of information. Um, once you get across the language barrier, and. There is a party, and the Brits, unsurprisingly, get hammered. And there are three trees in the quad, and <laughs> one or two of the Royal Air Force guys decides to climb them. Okay, sure, you know, get drunk, climb a tree. No big deal. And for some reason, the rest of the squadron decided that he needed to, or these two guys needed to get down, and they wouldn't get down. So what is a squadron to do? Naturally, you set the trees on fire, thereby forcing the guys that are up in the tree, who, by the way, are wearing Nomex, okay, to come down out of the tree, because even Nomex is going to be overpowered by a burning pine tree. So the pine trees are on fire. There's Royal Air Force guys in them. The fire department shows up, followed by the cops. The fire department extinguishes the trees, and the trees are now this smoking, steaming, you know, pile of combusted, semi-combusted wood, still standing vertically. And the police, of course, show up and they start talking to the people that are around who start speaking French. So two Royal Air Force guys who are also French speakers start trying to communicate in French with the American cops. That's not going to work. The American cops call the 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 French police detachment because the French have a police detachment because you need somebody to guard the warehouse full of red wine. That's how you knew where the red wine was. It's got a 24 hour French police guard and the French show up and they immediately determine that these men are not French. And they tell the Americans. And in the meantime, all the rest of the our Royal Air Force criminals, including the semi combusted ones, have disappeared. So it's just two guys who are pretending to be Frenchmen who unaccountably are not actually carrying their IDs and cannot be identified. And U.S. cops can't compel the Brits to give up the ID. So that's it. it over. And all that remains of this is the story and three combusted trees when I arrive. So I arrived and the, the, the detachment commander is Jean-Marc Chuas. We've got a pretty good uh, group of guys. Um, you know, I'm flying with... Uh, Brian Baxley. He's flying with Brian Baxley then. Um, and let's hold on. I'm going to get my... No, no, no. That's I got my detachment commander right. And this is, you know, a pretty good deal. Getting some time, flying combat missions. And we have an event called Return to FIDA. Now, the way northern Iraq was was divided up, and the reason there was a northern no-fly zone was to protect the Kurds north of the Green Line. And the Green Line went diagonally along the Great Zab River and along, um, we treat it as along the 36th parallel, but it actually followed the river down into uh, the Kirkuk area. But FIDA was an area that was supposed to be on the Kurdish side of the line, which the UN had imposed to protect the Kurds from Saddam after the Gulf War. 
and the Arabs had gradually crept up and by moving checkpoints had uh, basically pushed the Kurds north. And we were going to uh, provide air cover while the Kurds reestablished their checkpoints. So Return to Fida was out there. I don't remember who planned it, but it wasn't a weasel. It was a big operation, plenty of cover, strikers on board, uh, ready to rock if, you know, the, the Kurds with their American advisors had needed air support, full defense suppression, full counter air. And we're encountering bad radio conditions. Might have been jamming, might have just been bad radios. I rather suspect it was jamming. And somebody says Chattermark. Chattermark is the code word for switch to your alternate frequency. It is a guaranteed goat rope because you're jammed. Not everybody's going to hear the Chattermark call. So you're going to scatter half of your strike package. AWACS, who is the one on the frequency to everybody, you end up with guys on a weasel frequency, on a striker frequency, on an air-to-air -air frequency, all backups. We never get the strike package together. AWACS does not draw us together. And when the time expires, you know, we suddenly realize that everything seems quiet and I'm not seeing anybody's IFF codes. I'm not getting radar tracks. So we call the AWACS and they say, oh yeah, everybody else has gone home. Including they've pointed towards home and left two F4Gs out there in our cap. And we say, oh, well, I think we'll go home too. Uh, and we fly home and I'm pissed. The AWACS never drew us together. They suck. And this was a big communication for us is that the AWACS sucked. And in the debrief, this was in my non-inflammatory phase. If you can imagine me having a, well, let me just say a less inflammatory phase. <laughs> Where I decided it just wasn't worth it to debrief these guys in the mass debrief. And everybody else felt, you know, thought the same thing. They weren't going to learn. They weren't going to listen. The base command wasn't going to listen. It, it didn't matter. And so we let that kind of slide. It was a huge mistake. And there's still a bunch of folks on that deployment um, who remember that. And there's some guilt floating around because this is the deployment immediately prior to the Black Hawk shoot down. In which the way it worked out is the AWACS had no situational awareness. The Eagle guys completely buffooned it. And we ended up losing two Blackhawks full of Americans, including uh, Laura Piper, Lieutenant Piper, who had been loaned to us as an intel officer while we were deployed. Um, And that was partly contributed is that there was no adequate learning and debriefing culture at the time that would have served to catch the fact that the AWACS at the time were a clown act. They were overdeployed, they were undertrained, their proficiency sucked. Um, and that had come out earlier and, you know, we didn't talk about it. So that is the changeover in Star Baby where I never let anything in a, in a debrief. I never let it slide again. And, you know, Hoser tells me long decades after the fact that there was a lot of what's wrong with Star Baby questions because I just would not let it go. If there was a, a learning point to be made in a debrief, I was going to make it. And if I needed to be an ass about it, I'd be an ass about it. Sometimes in retrospect, too much of an ass about it, but you know, uh, at least I didn't let it slide. Didn't let it slide again. It was an important lesson learned not to let a debrief item go when it was relevant um, because you didn't think the other dude would listen. Maybe somebody would listen and you could break a chain of events. It's an important consideration for safety, flight safety as well. So that uh, that deployment um, still went well, um, but it was later marred by there were some critical mistakes we made. We had a great doofer book. I'd had a dead frog in it, um, which is unique in my experience at doofer books where a frog had been run over on the perimeter road and uh, so it had been flattened out and sunbaked. So we actually put it in the doofer book with scotch tape. I mean, it broke the spine of the book eventually, but we had a doofer book with a dead preserved frog in it. So how cool is that? In addition to all the other stuff we wrote in it. Um, you know, we had a good time. We learned a lot. I, I had an important lesson learned flying with Brian Baxley. And every day when you prep for a sortie, one of the things you do is the emergency procedure of the day. And you run through the EP of the day. And the EP was utility hydraulics failure. And foolishly, as we're talking about the EP, I said, I, you know, I've never had a utility hydraulics failure. Take off combat mission. And before we leave the 50 mile circle around Insulik, which we're allowed to train inside, you know, good mountains, decent airspace, 50 mile circle, we blow out the utility hydraulic system. 
And so the gauges go to zero and we declare an emergency and we come back and on, you know, we have to blow down the flaps and blow down the gear and take a cable. And, you know, boss is in the front. He's done this before. Um, and so, you know, for him, it's a non-event. For me, it's a lesson. Never say something stupid in a flight brief like, hey, you know, I've never had a utility hydraulic failure. Turns out that was the only utility hydraulic failure I remember in the F4, although I think we had a PC-1 hydraulic failure on a jet that I was actually taken to the boneyard. I ended up abandoning it at Dallas. Wow. Uh, or at Fort Worth, Fort Worth Naval Air Station. We just saw the trail of hydraulic fluid from the end of the runway to our taxi point and called the travel agent and got an American Airlines flight out to oh. Vegas. We were done. That airplane was somebody else's problem. It was a piece of shit anyway. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of things we, we remember about the first deployment to Insulik, you know, that year. And then the second deployment to Insulik, I'm back. I'm back six months later. Uh, and we, this time Hoser is the detachment commander, which is awesome. And, um, I show up with, uh, oh, I, I, I may be mixing my two dates, but I don't think so. Hoser's the Depco. We've got some of the same guys. This time I'm flying with Dennis Malfer. Um, we've got, uh, uh, Skip Jacoby, uh, is flying with us. You know, we got a pretty good crew and, you know, we'd had a, previous one of the EWOs on the previous deployment who I won't mention because we later court-martialed him was a problem because he just would not show up he was drunk he was out you know dancing with Turkish ballerinas or whatever you do when you're an idiot who will eventually get court-martialed um but this deployment Hoser Hoser you know runs a good deployment and this is I'm going to have him tell this story some point in the future but Let's just say we'll we'll put a hook in here for the upside down clown car in the stairwell, which also involves, as you would expect, the Brits. Um, and so that is again, it's a pretty good deployment. But one of the things we have during that deployment is the Great Flood. So it's a mission over northern Iraq, and rarely did we get a weather recall, and we get a weather recall, and so we all turned for home, and the. F-4's radar was crap. Went out to 200 nautical miles, had a decent amount of power. So it's not going to... It will see land at 200 nautical miles because it sees land great, even when you're in an air-to-air -air mode. It's entirely too much land, as we saw in the previous episode. And I see on the radar this wall of doom moving in from the med because it shows dense thunderstorm cells quite well, too, because of all that water. And we're smoking in towards, we're probably pushing it up to 480 knots. And it seems like this wall of doom is advancing on the Insulik at 480 knots. It's not, but it's getting closer and we're not sure we're going to beat it. So everybody pushes it up except for the Harriers. <laughs> and the F-4 seem, unusually, we seem to have the most gas. So we push it up the fastest. So we're the first guys down. We come in, we turn off into the hammerhead. We're able to de-arm. And, you know, as the lead ship, I was able to get into the shelter and shut the aircraft down before the rain started. And then various guys get caught behind. Well, the, the, the holdup is de-arm because everybody's carrying live ordnance and there's not enough space. And so what happens is as the rains start in, guys are stacking up at the end of the runway um, and they can't turn off the runaway. And you're landing with people on the runaway in front of you, which you're definitely not supposed to do. Because if you lose brakes or so on and you don't catch that thousand foot cable, you're going to run into a bunch of airplanes. But uh, but the weather's coming and it looks bad. And the last guys are, of course, the slow ones. They're the Harriers. Um, the AWACS are going to a different base. They, I think they divert to Antalya, um, which they want any excuse. AWACS wants any excuse to divert to Antalya. Because it's a better location. They're all in the hotels and they have the casinos there. That's where the tankers were based out of. So that's why I don't remember AWACS as part of this picture. Because they must have taken the option to divert early. Harriers are last because they're the slowest. And all they see is this onrushing wall of water doom and a bunch of airplanes stacked up at the end of the runaway. And they say, Harriers. And they just land on the taxiways. <laughs> you know, and, and call their guys and say, de-arm us in our shelters. Because, you know, Royal Air Force. And, uh, uh, you know, we were, we were drenched. It was 50 year floods actually put the runway underwater. 
put a bunch of the housing underwater and uh, Tent City was not faring so well. We didn't realize that because we're in our concrete multi-story dorms, you know, watching a football game or something in Stamp's room. Stamp's room was the spaghetti room. If you wanted to eat spaghetti and play football with loaves of bread in a room, you went to Stamp's. If you wanted quality food or Klondike bars, you came to mine, you know, um, and we would uh, we ended up sandbagging for days. Uh, but, you know, we got because we got a call and listed guys come up and say, hey, sirs, we're, we're having a rough time in uh, in Tent City. And we said, fine. And, you know, eight of us get out. I don't know where the other guys went. We went out, hooked up with the civil engineers. The civil engineers said, here's a bunch of shovels. Here's a bunch of empty sandbags. Here's a pile of sand. Have a nice day. And so we're filling sandbags in the rain in an environment where there is no discernible difference between the lightning flash and the thunder sound. Um, I think of it as the wettest I've ever been. And I'm a scuba diver. You know, you can't be any wetter than you are in a wetsuit at 100 feet. But I feel like I was wetter filling sandbags. Um, you know, and and that was one of the events. But one of the other important events is that I am, again, the youngest guy. Which means I'm the snacko. Which means I have to keep the porn locker up to speed. Okay. Now, that means I'm going to get our our soft porn at the base exchange. I'm not one of the guys that's going to go off base and track down Danish porn. Because I don't even want to see the cover. Right? And I don't even know what Turkish porn looked like in the 90s. But I'm pretty sure I wouldn't even have wanted to see it in a brown paper bag. Um... So we get that month's Playboy, and I naturally, I mean, I buy it. So I look at it first, and I pass it around to the guys, and and one of the Ewos comes up, a guy who's now a doctor, um, and says, "Have you seen this?" And I go, "Yeah, I've seen it. I gave it to you." He goes, "No, have you seen this?" And he points to, you know, one of the captions underneath the the photos, which honestly, I never read. <laughs> and what it says. It's the girls of the SEC, the Southeastern Conference Pictorial. And it says there, Julia Lee, Junior Zoology, University of Arkansas. Her choice in men, fighter pilots. That's the caption. And we go, we're fighter pilots. <laughs> and so we point this out. And Hoser is our detachment commander. Hoser has a silver tongue. He met his wife. And he'll have to tell the story. When he was out of alcohol at an outing on Lake Mead, he swam out to a random boat with a knife clenched between his teeth and boarded it. And so that's how he met his wife. They're still married, I might add. So obviously it was a match made in Lake Mead. And not all matches made in the Vegas area work out that well. <laughs> But Hoser is a silver-tongued devil, and he's just as good when in writing. So he writes the letter, you know, introducing us to Julia Lee. And um, that was, we sent it off. He got two addresses. It was sent, one was sent to the Playboy front office, like they don't get a million of these letters, right? So that goes straight in the circular file. Another one was sent to her at the zoology department at University of Arkansas, which I tracked down using the base library and the Barron's College Guide or something like that. And we forgot about it until we get a letter back from Julia Lee with a bunch of photos, just kind of around the block, you know, <laughs> photos of her out hunting or whatever you do in Arkansas when you're a zoology major. And, you know, she and we told her we were in Operation Provide Comfort. And she said, yes, she would be, you know. She thought that Operation Provide Comfort was a great idea. She'd like to provide an Operation Provide Comfort. And it's like, now she's a heroine. So we just go berserk, and we send her memorabilia. We send patches, including the obligatory Chicks Dig Weasels patch, um, which Spike discusses in his episode, which I'm not actually responsible for, um, other than ordering them, of course. But I didn't do the design. We send her blood chits, we autograph everything, we send her photos, and we get back a bunch of 8x10 color photos of her naked, signed, and autographed. I mean, this is a lovely relationship. And so at the end of the deployment, you know, we now have actually the ability to exchange contact data. At the end of the deployment, we invite her to the squadron, because why wouldn't you? 
And so she comes with her boyfriend uh, out and they visit the squatter. And she's actually short. Um, you know, she is surprisingly short, uh, uh, blonde hair. Um, but, you know, she we got her to sit in the cockpit. We, there was nothing weird going on. It was just a squadron visit. Yeah, you know, she saw the airplane. Um, but when the maintenance guys, what I didn't realize is in order to get to the cockpit, she's climbing up on a ladder and she's wearing a, a, a skirt that is too short for a flight line. She's not planned this out well, or she has planned this out well, depending. And it's a windy day. And so, again, I'm the guide, right? Because I arranged to be the guide because I was the only one, you know, who knew what was going on amongst all the deployments. So, and the guide, uh, you know, we took her out. But uh, when we took her out on the flight line, the maintenance side of the squadron faced the flight line and they have big plate glass windows. And what I didn't realize is that going on behind me at these plate glass windows Maintenance guys are knifing each other with multi tools in order to get space at the window <laughs> to watch this tour. <laughs> you know, we took her out on the town. We we actually took her to a a new place called Crown and Anchor, which was obviously a British pub. Now we went there for the beer because you wouldn't go to a British pub for the food or anything because that would be stupid. Um, and you know, we went to a bunch of strip joints because that's the part of of Vegas she wanted to see. And it's like okay. We'll go. We'll, we'll take that bullet for the team. So it was this weird kind of tour guide thing. And in response, she invites us to our air show, to her air show. And so this is where this comes full circle. She lives in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Fort Smith has an air show and we're going. And it's me and it's Hoser in the back seat. And it's Brian Reno and Stamp Walden in the front seat. And we show up at Fort Smith, Arkansas. We're the first guys to show up. And we look around and there are no airplanes there. There's an F-16 that lives there, and there's a bunch of Cessnas and, like, a Piper Warrior. And we're going, oh, this place is a dud. And Stamp says, we're not really here for the airplanes. <laughs> so we shut down, and we do our, you know, maintenance guys meet us. We do our circle around, you know, and a, a, we're waiting for a ride, and this Air Force bread van pulls up. And it's, okay, well, we can ride the bread van. We do it all the time. And they say, hey, you guys need, have you signed the sign-in sheets? And now I'm totally depressed. I mean, a sign-in sheet? What kind of Mickey Mouse bullshit chicken shit is this? A sign-in sheet. And I go, fine, I'll sign the sign-in sheet. I'm walking towards the van, and the back doors burst open, and the sign-out sheets climb out. And they are two women, one of whom has been enhanced by the Leonardo da Vinci of breast implants. And they're both wearing, like, men's wife-beater t-shirts. Okay? And... You know, I'm just pulling my eyes up to see who, um, you know, this person actually is when she hands me a black Sharpie and says, sign in, honey. It's like, okay. So we sign into the sign in sheets and from there it's an upslope. So we have rental cars and they're not rental cars. A local car dealership has provided us with brand new cars. Okay, um, one per crew so that we can get around town. We're in a hotel like we're going to spend any time there. And the first night they had rented a country and western bar um, for us to go to for the air crew party. And so um, we obviously we go and, you know, our sign in sheets are there uh, in all of their glory. And, you know, people are talking and, and aircraft had swarmed in Tomcats, Eagles. More Vipers, Hogs, Trainers. I mean, we had arrived early and then everybody had arrived. And this air show is packed with great stuff and great air crew. And we bring Julie Clem to the air crew party because why wouldn't we? Again, I don't drink. I'm the designated driver. So we, she parks at the hotel. We all go in one car. And I have to present, prevent Hoser from actually ripping the car to pieces because he's fairly hammered. Um, Like he was the night before. You know, the night four, we'd spent accidentally at, a, at another base. And I'll tell about the accidental base thing at some other point. Um, but, you know, Hoser just decides he needs to rip off the sun, the sunshade. <laughs> and at which point I threatened to break his arm. And I think the, the portion of his brain that isn't as hammered as it's going to be realizes that I'm not kidding. And I am, in fact, going to break his arm to preserve this new car. 
And so he settles down and we all go, we go to the party. And I remember, you know, going around the party and everybody wants to sign Julie's butt with a Sharpie pen. And they largely do. I decline. Um, for reasons that aren't clear to me in retrospect. Um, probably too many witnesses. That's what I'm thinking. And I remember walking past two of the Tomcat guys and these guys are tall. I mean, I'm 5'11 on a good day when I'm not hunched over. These guys are just tall. And I hear one of them say to the other, it's like, I think Miss Playboy is going home with us or going home with me. And I stop because I just passed them. And I take four steps back and I look up at this dude and I say, seeing as how she came in with me, I seriously believe that she's going home with me. And I walk on. Now, this is true because I'm her ride to her parked car. You know, everybody on this deployment is married. We're we're no threat at all. Um, And so that's exactly how it turns out. The weasels are getting huge points. Not only do we bring Julia in, <laughs> um, but, you know, she has a good time. Air crew have a good time. And we leave with Julia in tow. All because it was prearranged and all because I'm a taxi driver. Um, and so that was, you know, the other thing that was cool about that air show was her, her parents own, or her dad, her dad owns a pizza restaurant where fighter aviators eat free, where I had my first and only cheeseburger pizza, which thinks like it, it sounds like it would be totally freaking disgusting. It was awesome. Wow. You know, so we fly home, we go via Albuquerque because we don't have, uh, uh, you know, we don't have the gas to make it all the way from Arkansas. We go home. And uh, end of story. I mean, great story. We we actually kept uh, in contact with Julia for some time. She eventually married an F-18 guy around 1997. Um, yeah, so she her, her choice in men, fighter pilot, although, you know, Navy fighter pilots, she was obviously going down the scale, but, um, you know, it, it worked out. And uh, uh, that was our, our weird, you know, one of our weird air show experiences. But there was an afterwards. So I'm in scheduling, and remember, I've returned to the base, and now I'm in scheduling, as I'm holding scheduling up, and I get a call from a guy who identifies himself as from the FAA. And he says, I need to talk to one of the crews from Retro 3-1 or Retro 3-2, which is a cross-country call sign, on May 31st, 1994, or whatever it was, 1995. And it must have been 95. And I go, yeah, hold on, let me look it up. Oh, wait, I was on that flight. Talk to me. The guy says, okay, so we filed into a low-level route, which crosses Lake Powell, IR-286, where you go past portions of the Great of the Grand Canyon, where you can fly low, you fly across Lake Powell. It's a low-level route designed so you can fly B-52s down canyons. Very cool route. You pick it up north of Albuquerque, it leaves you out northeast of Nellis. Um, and it actually ends earlier, or it starts earlier than that, because a B-52 and an F-4 don't compare for gas. Um, so, you know, the B-52 has plenty of it, and it's a really long route, and it's it's one of the best low-level routes in the U.S. So this guy says, okay, so I got a report that two F-16s blew over a houseboat on Lake Powell on this date at this time, and you guys were the only ones in the in the flight. And I said, okay, well, I'll tell you two things. The first thing is that we had the acting squadron commander in the backseat of the number two jet. So I can assure you that there's nothing dumb, different, or dangerous going on. That was bullshit. Holders is a lunatic. <laughs> um, And the second thing I said is, if they can't tell the difference between an F-4 and an F-16, we weren't at 300 feet. And the guy goes, I'll buy that. And I never heard of it again. Now, truthfully, the min altitude was 500. We never went below 500. Um... And so, and we can go over a houseboat at 500 feet legally. You know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, that's, that's our avoidance criteria uh, under the rules. So no big deal. What I didn't know is that another flight coming back from another air show, also under the retro call sign, led by none other than Spike, apparently, had entered and flown the low level route without filing it or without calling air traffic control. And it's entirely possible, although I wasn't there, that they blew over a houseboat at 300 feet. But I did not know that at this time. And so there was another, the Phantom Retro was in there. Um, and there was some something other going on. But it was not our flight. It was not me. And uh, 
that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But the FAA, the I think what clinched it was you can't tell the difference between an F four and an F sixteen. We're not at three hundred feet. <laughs> could also have been F sixteens in the route, but I couldn't imagine where they'd have come from. Uh, since they only have like a drop and a half of gas, uh, it'd be kind of hard for them to fly. So, you know, that was F four G's at Nellis. You know, it wasn't all fun and games and air shows. Um you know, we had the Dayton Air Show, which was great, you know, where we were part of a photo shoot for Muscle and Fitness magazine. They brought one of our models to pose all over the airplane and take photos. You know, we put her in one of her. She's wearing some black spandex thing. We put a G-suit on her. It's a pretty good photo shoot, actually. Um, and it was like we were the airplane closest to base ops. So when the guys came out, that's what that's why they apparently picked the Phantom. Although, admittedly, it looks really good. Um, there was the accidental, you know, trip to... Uh, not Barksdale Air Force Base, Bergstrom, Texas. Um, great tech. I can get into that. We got time. Well, we <laughs> air show travel. This will wrap up. This is my last air show story that I can recall. Um, and it's on the way to the Fort Smith Air Show. We are going to go to Albuquerque, and we have to go early because Friday is a day off. So we have to depart. We have to depart on Thursday, which means we're going to spend Thursday night someplace else. So we're going to go Albuquerque and then Naval Air Station, New Orleans. When we get to Albuquerque, we check the weather. Naval Air Station, New Orleans has intermittent thunderstorms. So we have to carry gas for an alternate. The only suitable alternate is Meridian, Mississippi. There is no way we're going to risk being stuck overnight in Meridian, Mississippi. So... We say, where else should we go? And somebody says, one of the guys says, let's go to Bergstrom. Star Baby, get us a PPR, prior position required. Never been there. Call up, get a PPR for the base. Um, Fly to Bergstrom, which is in Austin, Texas. And we land. And, you know, the base ops guys say, where did you get that make made up PPR number? And I said, bullshit. I called ahead and got a PPR number. They said, no, that's not a valid PPR number, and the ops group commander is pissed because they weren't going to let us in. Now, it's an old guard F-4 base. The guard maintenance guys were happy to see us. They were so happy to see us, they wanted to know if the airplanes need any maintenance. And when we got them back the next day, they were shinier than Uh they had been when we dropped them off. I think they not only took them to the wash rack, but they waxed the noses. Wow. Which shouldn't happen to a combat aircraft, by the way, because it develops glint, but best looking air show aircraft ever. Turns out I got my B bases mixed up. I'd called base ops at Barksdale, Louisiana, which is someplace you don't want to go. Gotten a PPR number, filed to Bergstrom with our Barksdale PPR number. And we went to Austin. Austin has Sixth Street, which is a, you know, river walk, bar, college scene. You know, where we went and ate, you know, food, listened to music. Hoser left an $80 tip that night because he was hammered. And he was the, the, there was a Grateful Dead concert going on. And our, our waitress couldn't make it to the Dead concert. She was depressed. So Hoser felt that an $80 tip would, you know, help out the night. But he was all four sheets. He was five sheets to the wind. There's like a phantom sheet you've never even heard of. And he'd, he'd had that one to the wind. Uh, and you know, that night was rounded out by two unnamed aviators in the flight pretending they were Jedi in the Holiday Inn with a bunch of fluorescent light tubes that had unaccountably been left out in the hallway, complete with sound effects, except that the additional sound effect with a fluorescent tube is the sound of breaking glass because they don't stand up like a real lightsaber would or even a fake lightsaber would. I mean, I've got... More accurately, uh, my sons have lightsabers you can actually fight with. Uh, you know, my uh, my middle child actually asked for an early birthday, maybe birthday number six, for real a real lightsaber, promising not to use it in the house. <laughs> Had to break it. There's no such thing as a real lightsaber. But there are <laughs> lightsabers you can fight with. <sighs> Fluorescent tubes are not an adequate substitute. So that's kind of flying the F4G at Nellis. Um did a lot of uh, operations there and away, learned a lot, you know, added in a bunch of combat sorties. I think I ended up with 80 some odd uh, sorties and it was the last great fighter squadron. I mean, we we were shuffled off 
And I've already told the stories about confronting General Lowe in the O Club and, you know, events like that. Um, we had a high mission capable rate, but we were expensive. We had a good supply of spare parts because we had a bunch of jets in the boneyard. Um, mm -hmm. I went there, I think, in 94, 95, and I counted 1,050 Phantoms in the boneyard, of which 1,044 were flyable. That meant a good supply of spares, a good supply of spare engines, even though we had the we had the 17 Gs, uh, which are the low smoke engines. So, um, you know, a more limited supply of that, but we had great maintainers. And so while the aircraft was old, it was still capable. And the F-16 CJ was pitched as an interim solution, and it managed to slip in when we were retired. And so the Guard followed us into retirements just three months later, uh, and the aircraft and the capability largely went away. Uh, and has not since been replaced. I have hopes for the F-15EX that there being a G version, but it's going to take some serious rethinking at the Air Force level in order to make something like that happen. What, what sort of impetus do you think there would be required to, to create that thinking? Um, I fear that it won't happen unless there is a massive loss of aircraft, U.S. aircraft, to a radar threat. Because there is nothing, oh, there's no Yom Kippur war, uh, hopefully in the future, to drive that point home. So I think it's going to take a major disaster. But it is possible that somebody might just wise up and realize, looking at the Ukraine and Russian operations and what we've gleaned from those, that you don't have to have a major disaster in order to learn something, and it doesn't have to be your conflict in order to learn something. No. Um, but I, I think the knowledge base of what the weasels provided is so low um, and that that it will be difficult to see that come over. But we'll see. Great question, because I, I do need to I do need to wrap up. But just from a technology point of view, then, uh, you know, this has been another area that, that we've talked about before. It's obviously, um, you know, there is obviously a set of opinions around it. Um, you have a strong set of opinions of your own about it. But the wild weasel mindset, the training of EWOs, the creation of two-seat aircraft um, or, or a dedicated capability for, for wild weasel, let's say, because it doesn't, I suppose it could be multi-crew, it doesn't just have to be two-seat, but from a tactical sort of point of view, I guess two-seat makes sense. But from a technological point of view, do you think, um, you know, having started this conversation, talked about APR 38 and the jump then to 47 and the replacement of the WASP with the Hawk with the WASP and the, the you know, the development of the, the technological capability to pinpoint a radar, to have those different levels of confidence in, in its location and its identity and, and so on and so forth. Is it likely that the things that are happening with the F-35 incorporate the natural evolution of um, wild weasel system development? You know, we told a lot about the F-35 being this platform that sucks in all the trons, that builds the picture. The pilot is the um, battle manager, the warfare manager responsible for flying the airplane, but then looks out at this picture and can see the world. As part of that capability, do you think there's been a uh, continued development of wild weasel technologies, let's say? Oh, there's definitely development of technologies that would be useful. Um, one of the things you have to consider, though, is antennas. Because antennas are also re-radiators. And so antennas on stealth aircraft are very special. Um, and they they you have you run into certain physics limitations. Uh, otherwise, you turn into something with a large radar cross-section because you've got antennas everywhere. Um, so there are always certain limitations that are going to be imposed by, one, your LO requirements, and two, the size and shape of your airframe. Bigger airframe, longer baseline. The F-35 is actually pretty, you know, a pretty decent size airplane for a single engine. Um there are certain benefits that you get out of that. But yes, there's technologies. There's technologies that can be enhanced with data links. So there's cooperative stuff. There are things like time difference of arrival or frequency difference of arrival schemes that can add to it because now I could layer. I could do a direction of arrival and a, a frequency different of arrival system 
Um, right now, I mean, the, there was a system called PLAID, P-L-A-I-D, that was proposed, gee, in the 90s. Okay, designed and proposed in the 90s. The technology's there. Um, you're still going to have a hard time with the training aspect of it if you don't have a trained air crew member, really an EWO, who is listening to the signals. There are just some things that even with an AI that you are not going to discern easily. Although I can say that with improved speech recognition techniques being applied to signal uh, audio, you might very well get there, but it's going to take a bit of an investment. Um, so there are definitely technologies you can do. Uh, and the, the reason to have two seats is because it's a ridiculously busy environment. But I think a lot of the EWO knowledge about the threats um, is going to be very hard to replicate. You know, because if you train somebody on threat knowledge like they're an EWO, then they're an EWO. Yeah. So it's hard to get away from that, um, from the fact that the EWOs were the best trained for dealing with the threats, that we sometimes got an opportunity. Like I mentioned that I, I trained in an SA3, an East German SA3 with East German instructors to get familiarization on that that came in handy. Did the same thing uh, with NSA8. Um, all stuff that came over from uh, uh, the the Soviet bloc. So all those pieces and parts, the technology is better. There are still physics limitations on your antennas and you need to add on to the training. So not only remember, everybody front and back seat went through a weasel school. So it's not a two weeks course. This was a formal course follow on the FTU. Uh, and if you want to play that game, the best of the system ability, you need to send guys to a weasel school. You think uh, so? Last question, but but you know, can aggressors uh, in some way uh, act as sort of substitutes then for that in terms of maintaining some level of corporate knowledge within the air force at the moment? So, if we talk about the demise, let's say, of the wild weasel EWO um, at the end of the, the mid nineties, end of the nineties, um, you moved to the F fifteen E. You talked about that, and and um, you talked about how you were the sort of um, you, know, you put together the threat guys. You used your EWO training to do that for the striking community. Um, you know, is, is it possible that the aggressor guys who have subject matter experts who probably are doing similar things and know a lot about you know threat systems, maybe not so much the air to ground, uh, the the service to air stuff, more the air to air stuff. But is it possible they can act as a sort of a, a placeholder then for for we for an EWO weasel? until the Air Force gets its act together and decides to bring them back? On the threat knowledge side, yeah, but they, they've they already lost it on the uh, on the tactics knowledge side because, I mean, let's let's look at it. They, it wasn't just the F-4G EWOs that went away. At the same time, we lost the EF-111 EWOs, and we had just lost the, the you know, we don't talk about the recce EWOs with the Tarek system, but the uh, Tarek system on the RF-4C did tactical electronic reconnaissance. Mm. Um, so that base was the, the the whole fighter EWO. We still generate EWOs, we send them to fighters, but they don't go into a fighter with EW capabilities. Um, and so that has largely been lost. The tactics that the F-16 has developed are based on the harm, and they're based on the HDS. And the F-35 will develop some tactics um, again, using the HARM and the ARGUM and the ARGUM ER um, that are going to add some capabilities that, you know, block three HARM shooters. ARGUM ER is amazing. You know, ARGUM is amazing. These are exceptional weapons, but a lot of the tactics is going to, they're going to have to be reconstructed. And you don't want to be in the position where we are in the position right now is where the U.S. Air Force was in the position in 1965, where to start Wild Weasel 1, they had to pull EWOs from SAC and put them in the back of a bunch of F-100 guys and marry them together. And they lost a lot of airplanes and a lot of dudes building that capability, which culminated in the F-4G and then was uh, largely left to blow away, to turn into dust and blow away. So there still has to be a rebuild. And I... I, I my hope is that it doesn't look like 1965 through 68. My fear is that that's what actually happens. 
Well, um, I'm not sure where else you're going to get amazing stories and erudite and informed discussion around some of the technical aspects of the airplane. So thank you very much indeed for giving us another two hours, 22 minutes of your time. Yeah, so another long episode, and you know we're running out of Star Baby episodes. I think the AT six will wrap it up, and I, like the Phantom, can ride off in the sunset. You're never going to uh, ride up into the sunset. You'll be back in three weeks. Thanks for tuning in to Temp Century. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.